This is Dr. Karen, and you are listening to the DeFacto Leaders Podcast, where I help pediatric therapists become better leaders so they can make a bigger impact with their services. On this show, I'll share up-to-date evidence-based practices, my own experiences, and guest interviews designed to help clinicians and educators feel more confident in the way that they serve their caseloads so they can help school-age kids grow up to be successful, kind, well-adjusted people. Hey there, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 102 of the DeFacto Leaders Podcast. In this episode, I have special guest Brett Stevens. So Brett is a special education consultant. She actually spent time as a teacher and a school administrator, and now she is working on her doctorate in curriculum and instruction, so soon to be Dr. Stevens. And she does research in the area of literacy, reading, and is close to being done with her doctoral dissertation where she's looking into literacy services and interventions for autistic students. So we get into a great conversation. I've wanted to have someone on to talk about the science of reading for a long time. A lot of my work has been informed by this and a lot of my programs that I have written are based on this research, but I wanted to get a perspective of someone who is currently working with districts and working on curriculum to really get the literacy curriculums in the schools aligned with evidence. So we get into a great conversation and she shares some great tips for working with parents and giving them ideas about how they can support literacy in the home. We also talk about how teams can work better together and just give a general overview of what the science of reading actually is and all of the different approaches to reading instruction out there and which ones are and are not evidence-based. Before I get going, I wanted to share a couple different things with you. So in this episode, we talk a lot about how the whole team can work together. So depending on what you want to work on right now in your clinical practice and what your position is, you may want to either focus on what you're doing in therapy, or you might be struggling to implement support across the board with your entire team. So if you are a speech language pathologist and you want to know how you can create a system for your language therapy so that you know you're working on the language skills your kids need in order to support reading and writing, which is something that we get into a lot in this conversation, then definitely check out my Language Therapy Advanced Foundations program for SLPs. To learn more about that program, you're going to want to go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language therapy. In this program, I share a comprehensive framework with SLPs where I walk through step-by-step strategies that you can use in your therapy to support the language skills that kids need, to support academic skills, as well as reading and writing. So if you're a speech pathologist and you feel like you don't have a good system for language therapy, you'll definitely want to check it out. Just go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language therapy. Now, I've also been talking a lot about how teams can work together to provide comprehensive supports for kids that support mental health, behavior, social skills, and executive functioning. So as you may know, executive functioning impacts so many different things. It really should be embedded into all of the things that kids do across the day. So that means that everyone who comes into contact with that child should be supporting executive functioning in some way. So if you are a therapist and you feel like you have a handle on what you're doing in therapy, but you know that you need to provide support across the day for your students, and you wanna get your team on board with providing those comprehensive supports, the best way to do that is to focus on executive functioning and to figure out everyone's role in the process so that you can start to train the other people on your team and collaborate so that kids can get the support that they need across their day. 
Now, obviously that is no small task. That's why I've created the Executive Functioning Implementation Guide where I outline why these skills are so important. So if you need to get your administration on board, I share some information that will be really important for you to present to them. And then I also get into everyone's role in the process, including the teachers, the special ed teachers, the paraprofessionals, the related service providers, even the students and the parents. So to check out that free guide, you're gonna to wanna to go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash efschools. Again, that's drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash efschools. So now please enjoy this interview with Brett Stevens. Today, I am joined by Brett Stevens from the Science of Special Ed podcast. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Hi, I'm excited to be here with you. So I thought we could just start off by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and how, you know, what led you to the work that you're doing right now? Yeah, sure. I feel like um, my origin story gets a little bit complicated. Um, I've been in special education in some form or fashion for the last 20 years. I started off as a teacher um, and I graduated from college. I was 20. I got my first teaching job. I was the only special education teacher in the building, K through eight. I had kids that were in and out for resource. I had kids that were with me all day. It was kind of just a hot mess. Wow. Um, and I was 20, right? So I had just left school and I didn't really know what I was doing, but I thought I did. Um, but it was a really good experience because just right off the bat, I had students with all types of disabilities, all different situations. Um, that I was working through. And then uh, from there, just two years later, I was uh, promoted to be the special education administrator for um, the charter school that I was working at. So I had 13 schools in Ohio that I was in charge of. So then I got to travel around um, and got a lot more experience just seeing how different one school to the next can be um, mm -hmm. for special education and how things are organized and the roles that people play. So that was a really good experience. And from there, I um, decided to go to law school. I wanted to do special education law. So I went to law school at night and got my special education degree. And for a few years, I ventured off to try and be a special education attorney. And I quickly found that I did not like it yeah. <laughs> at all. I did not like it at all. And one of the main reasons I, I didn't enjoy it was because I felt like I was coming into the situations at a point where we were past, you know, no return, right? Like yeah. at that point, people were already upset. Nobody was willing to budge. And we really weren't helping the student at all, I felt. And I kept thinking to myself, well, man, if I had been the teacher, right? Or if I had been the administrator, I could have solved this problem, you know, two years ago, <laughs> yeah. rather than getting getting to this point. And uh, I really missed teaching. Um, I missed that interaction, you know, with the kids every day. Um, so I went back to school. I'm actually uh, currently finishing my educational doctorate in curriculum and instruction. And um, for the last five years, I have done a little bit of teaching, a little bit of consulting and really working with schools on their literacy within special education. My doctorate that I'm finishing up at the moment, I'm working on um, my dissertation is really about working with students with autism and literacy and, and um you know, what those best practices are for that population of students. So that's kind of where I'm at now and how I got here. Wow. I have so many questions about that topic. <laughs> I was going, if you, if you didn't share, I was going to ask where you were in the process. So, so are you, are you a, at the candidate stage where you're doing dissertation yes. research? Where yep. So you're collecting data? Yes. Yep, I am getting all the data, writing all the chapters. Um, in fact, I was just on a call with with uh, one of my committee members in tears. <laughs> it's just such an arduous process, you know, I know. trying to you know, get everything. And I'm really on the home stretch here of putting it all together. So almost done by the by the end of this year, I will be Dr. Dr. Oh, Brett Stevens is, Esquire. <laughs> that is exciting. Maybe you can be on again once your your dissertation is out yeah. there and tell us about your research. Yes. When you're Dr. Stevens. <laughs> So is it an EDD or a PhD? 
EDD. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's mine is an EDD and special ed and people get it confused all the time. Sometimes people think it's a clinical doctorate and it, yeah, it just, I think that there right. might be some EDD programs that are clinical doctorates, but most of them are terminal degrees yes. like CNI, yeah. special ed. Um, some of the other ones are as well. Yeah. So yeah. Um, okay. So I, it's interesting that you are are looking at interventions for autistic students because with the science of reading stuff, which we're going to get into in a few minutes here, there's a lot of debate about how to work with that population specifically, especially when it comes to the science of reading, the yes. language skills, <laughs> whole word, you know, whole language, all of that. So um, why don't we, I'm, I'm probably going to cycle back to asking right. about that later, but <laughs> let's start off by just talking about like, what is the science of reading? If you can yeah. just give an overview of that. Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind when we hear that term science of reading and I see it on social media pages and stuff like just thrown around. Yeah. Um, and what we really mean when we're talking about the science of reading is we're talking about really this really large collection of research that has been amassed over decades, right? Across countries, you know, it's not just the United States, across, you know, the world and in different um, different areas, right? So we have neuroscientists, we have education, mm -hmm. you know, researchers, we have psychologists, we have linguistics, all of that research kind of coming together to give us an idea of what works to teach reading and what doesn't work to teach reading um, yeah. to our students. So it's really kind of this broad um, idea. And a lot of times I see people referring to it as like, it's some sort of program or it's some sort of curriculum yeah. and it's, it's not right. So every single curriculum company has now rebranded themselves as like science of reading aligned. Uh, but what I like about when I like to think about science of reading, I like to think about it as really evolving, right? We, we have more research, research every day that's coming out. So even within the science of reading community, there's some things that people disagree on, right? We don't necessarily have all of the answers, but what mm -hmm. we have found from the research is some pretty consistent things that don't work or that do work for students. Um, one of the best ways to kind of think about what all of those things are, I think, is Scarborough's Reading Rope. Yep. And for anyone that hasn't seen that, just Google it because it's a really great image. And when we have a rope, we have all of these different strands that have to come together. And what Scarborough's reading rope tells us is we've got two main strands that we have to look at. One is the word recognition skills. So that would be those things like phonics, you know, decoding um, phon phonological awareness, uh, and also have the strand for language. And that's going to include all sorts of things, vocabulary, background knowledge, you know, the structure of our sentences. Um, and we really need to have both of those things intertwined and working together in order to have productive, you know, readers that can comprehend what they're reading. So yeah. it's really just a combination of all of those things. A lot of times we hear people um, when they say science of reading, they're talking about just that phonics because that's really um a big push right now is that phonics piece, but that's just a very small piece of the reading puzzle. Yeah, I saw an article floating around the internet a few weeks ago about, it seemed like it had a journalistic twist on it and it seemed like they were more on the reading recovery side of things, basically questioning science of reading saying, you know, it was one of those articles where you read it and you're like, what? what are they actually saying? It's so twisted and yeah. circular <laughs> logic. And, and so I think it was something like the science of reading isn't, isn't, I don't, I think basically they were saying that it's not just all about phonics, but if you really are thinking about the science of reading, you are talking about those other elements. And I'm yeah. talking to like, when I am mentoring speech language pathologists, for example, a lot of times they want to know where they fit into the puzzle when they're you know, working in a school and they have 30 minutes a week with kids and they think, okay, where do I fit into this? And I do often say, okay, you have a student in the classroom who's working on comprehension. They're working on inferencing and problem solving. And all of those are really important skills, but just because they're doing that in the classroom, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you do in your sessions, because what if they're missing something that's causing them to not respond to the comprehension 
instruction? Right. What if it's that they are using so many cognitive resources trying to decode a word because they don't have strong phonological awareness and morphological awareness. And so they can't comprehend because all their cognitive resources are used up or the syntax and the vocabulary. And so a lot Mm -hmm. of times where I have them intervene is really with the syntax and the semantics and the language aspect. But that the way that that has to work is that there already has to be some robust reading yeah. instruction going on with the phonics, because a lot of times a speech pathologist, if they have 30 minutes a week, they can't deliver all of the spelling and reading instruction. And so it's really got to be that team approach there. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that it falls in line with that where it's where people where I, when I was in the schools, I would get frustrated because people would be like, well, really all we care about is comprehension. So why don't we work on that? And then mm-hmm. it's like, well, why aren't they comprehending? you skipped over all this foundational stuff that they need to learn how to do in order for them to have the resources available to comprehend. Yeah. I always describe like the comprehension is an outcome, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's an outcome and it, it, you need all of these skills in order to get to that outcome. Um, and so practicing comprehension in isolation, I have found is not very fruitful or productive, yeah. um, you know, because you're right. What are the underlining reasons why we aren't comprehending is what we need to to look at for sure. Yeah. So when we think about, before we go on, let, can we just sum up again? If you, if you Google Scarborough's reading rope, what are the things, those pieces that have to be there in order for kids to be strong readers? Yeah. So we have the, that language comprehension piece, which really includes um, background knowledge, vocabulary, the structure of our language, um, verbal reasoning, literacy knowledge, even knowing things like different genres, right? We The way that we read jo- a different genres is, is different. Um, you need that section. And then you also need that word recognition section, which includes the, the phonological awareness, that decoding piece, those that sight recognition of words. And really all of those things need to come together. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, a lot of, I like the, the rope visual. It makes it a little bit more tangible. I think right. metaphors are helpful for people to understand yeah. things. <laughs> for sure. Yes, absolutely. I actually talked a lot about, um, I did get into Scarborough when I was doing my dissertation research, but also Marilyn Nippold is another big name where she, you know, is, has looked at kids with the older research will say speech and language impairment, the the newer will say, you know, DLD. Um, but just that a lot of kids that have those processing difficulties, if they just get comprehension instruction and no, no instruction in the language, that a lot of times those comprehension issues persist. You know, yeah. if you look longitudinally at kids from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, so... So when you think about all the different approaches that are out there, I know that you kind of have to think about all right, what's the approach? And then you have to think about how do we deliver this when we're thinking big picture about programming? So maybe we could go into like, what is when we have whole word versus print to speech and speech to print and all of those types of things, maybe to find that and then kind of talk about, all right, once we know what those are and what we need to be doing, how are we organizing this as far as service delivery? Yeah, so I I think it's important. One of the things that we've learned from the research, you know, in the science of reading is that everybody learns to read in the same way. Um, And you'll still hear people say like, oh, well, you know, there's all these different ways to teach reading, but there's really not. (laughs) Everyone, everyone's brain works the same way and learns to read in the same way. And, um, you know, over the last several decades, we've had different uh, approaches to reading. And some of the big ones, especially for our students with disabilities, have been whole word. Mm -hmm. And that is where a program will just uh, teach students to look at a word and memorize the word as almost a picture, right? So they'll show them the word horse, they'll drill them on, you know, with a flashcard, you know, here's, this is horse. So that when the student sees that image or that shape, they read the word horse. Um, There's no phonics, no decoding. They're just memorizing these words. The problem with that is kind of twofold. Number one, you can only memorize so much, right? So you kind of tap out after a couple of hundred words. So it looks really promising. And I still have teachers really hesitant to let go of these programs because they have a struggling reader. And all of a sudden, the reader is reading 10, 20, 30 words. And the parent is, you know, they're able to send home a list with the parent and the parent's hearing their students 
read and I'll read in quotation marks. Yeah. But, you know, say the say word that's words. on the page. Are yeah, they they're reading reading or not? So it seems really productive and you're like, oh, this is great. But they can only memorize so many, right? So then by the time they get to fourth, fifth grade, they're not progressing, right? They, yeah. they can't learn anymore. And really, it's not very functional. So when they get out of high school, knowing 100, 200 words is not going to help them read a bus, you know, a bus uh, map. It's not going to help them read an email from their boss. You know, how often do you see the word horse that you're going to have, you know, in functional activities? You're not. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's problematic. Um, the other approach that we hear a lot about is balanced literacy. And mm -hmm. originally, I think balanced literally what lit literacy was kind of created to try and look at all of those pieces of the ropes. Uh, but what's happened is with most of the programs that are so-called balanced literacy programs, the phonics or the decoding piece is just kind of thrown in there in a not very systematic way, right? So you might have a story that you're reading to the students and you notice that they struggled with um, IGH. So you pull a group to the back and you work on that sound. But working on those things without that larger systematic, you know, scope is it doesn't have a lot of generalization, right? The students yeah. don't remember those things and they don't, they don't bring them in. So that's where we've seen a lot of pushback on, on the balanced literacy programs. So right now, um, if you look at science of reading approaches, things that seem to be, um, you know, what we know works, if we're looking at that smaller phonics part, because that's really where a lot of that controversy is, we have um, speech to print. So that would be things like um, your Orton Gillingham type programs, mm -hmm. um, Wilson, lots of things that are used in, in a, a lot of our schools now, um, which is great. It takes students through a very systematic approach to learning and decoding. Um, it's a very long program, though. So if you, you know, decide to get an Orton Gillingham tutor for your child, you could be talking three, four years of, of tutoring to get through the program. So we also have uh, each to print. This is where we are starting with what the student knows, right? So instead of holding up a flashcard with an A and saying, this is A, it makes the sound ah, we're starting with the sounds. So we're saying to the student, you know, here's an apple. What sound do you hear at the beginning of that word? And they're identifying these things that they are already using, right? They're already speech. They're already speaking. <laughs> they already have that language. So we're taking what they already know and scaffolding it the opposite way. And it seems like a really small thing. Um, but a lot of times our kids don't make the connection. When we go print a speech, we're just asking them to memorize a bunch of letters and sounds, right? They're not making that connection that what you're seeing on the paper, these letters, these graphemes that we're putting down are the way that we communicate what we're speaking with our sounds. So it really helps them make that connection a lot quicker, I find, um, when we're focusing on the sounds and how they relate to the print uh, for our students. But either one of those approaches has a lot of research behind them. And, um, you know, students are making a lot of progress with with speech to print or print to speech. And so Wilson and Orton Gillingham would be print to speech. And then there's the other ones that are starting with the language. So there's a, have you heard of a company called Learning by Design? It's spell links. Yeah. So that would be a speech to print. Right. Yep. Yeah. And I know that I've, I've gone to some of their trainings and their rationale behind it is we innately are born knowing language. We are not born knowing how to read and write. So right. we take what we are already born with and we map print on top of that and not the other way around. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that and is for a lot of our students with disabilities who struggle with making those connections to the real world, right? You immediately have that connection built in, right? They're using yeah. these words every day. They're immediately seeing the benefit of oh, this is another way that I can communicate, right? What I'm already doing every day. It's just putting this onto paper yeah. so or reading it, you know, from paper. So yeah, I think that it, it, I think it has a lot of promise for our students. And I've seen a lot more growth um, transitioning to, to more of that speech to print approach. Well, and that's the other rationale for building language, because if you're mapping the, the, the print on top of the language, if you don't have as much language there, you're not going to have as much to work with. 
So that's why language is such an important component of this and why sometimes, well, and, and again, there is research to show that the oral, the oral language is correlated with reading and writing abilities as well because of that, that it, it's guiding that. Yeah. So when we're thinking about actually doing intervention, like let's say that we have like, you know, you've got a third grade classroom and you have some kids who are still, you know, that's the, where the big transition happens, third, fourth grade, where it's, all right, now we're really getting into more of the content areas. Um, we're getting into, there's multimorphemic words popping up in the curriculum. And now we have to read a textbook and comprehend and instead of, you know, again, the learning to read versus reading to learn, but you have some students who are still not where they need to be. I mean, what is, when you're thinking about what is evidence-based and how you actually deliver this, how can that look from sort of a service delivery design standpoint? Yeah, and I think a lot of it goes back to, especially when we're talking about students who have already been identified, right? We have this team approach where we're looking at what's best for, for the student and where are, where are they going to get that instruction and that placement? I try and encourage us to do as much as possible within that general education classroom. And I think a lot can be done even as we get into the older grades. Um, but depending on the disability, they might need might need more than that. One of the things that um, I have always pointed out is to look at it as a long game, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of our students, especially if we're talking about students who have developmental or cognitive delays are in school with us till they're 21. Right. So they might not be on grade level in third grade, but that's okay. We have a long time to work mm -hmm. with them if we're consistent. And a lot of research shows, especially with our students with cognitive or developmental disabilities, that it's going to take longer, but it absolutely can be done. So what I oftentimes see is when we move to third grade, people see that the student is not keeping up with the classroom. And so they immediately move them out of reading altogether, right? And just say, oh, they're not going to learn how to read and just yeah. move on. Mm -hmm. Or they move them to this whole word type of program where they're just memorizing some words rather than looking at it from a long game perspective as we still have a significant amount of years to work with the student. Um, a lot of these interventions can be done in a small group, right? Um, or, you know, pulled out if we need to pull out into an individual one-on-one -on -one session, if we can, we can absolutely do that. I think that looking at it from a, a team approach is really important because really a lot of times what these students need is to generalize those skills across their day. Yeah. The speech language pathologist, you mentioned, you know, earlier too, like where they can fit in and really they can fit in to all of those strands of the rope. Yeah. They're so diverse. <laughs> um, and, but we need to find a way that the whole team is working together to support Absolutely. that student. And I think communication is the number one thing, right? Making sure that everyone's on the same page. So if you have a general education teacher and you have a special education teacher, you might have a speech language pathologist. Everyone needs to understand exactly where the student's weakness is. So I think the assessment piece is huge um, to really pinpoint where that weakness is. And then laying out with the team, what is the general education teacher going to do in their class? What is the speech language pathologist going to do? Can we bring the speech language pathologist into the classroom, into the general education classroom and teach, you know, a lesson that probably is going to benefit everybody, right? A lot of these things can be benefit, um, benefit to the whole group. So I think it's really a matter of looking at the individual student and seeing what their exact weaknesses are, figuring out what the best place is going to be for them to receive that instruction, and then working together as a team to communicate so that they're getting that instruction there. We're, we're working on that weakness throughout their entire day. Yeah. The way that I describe it is I say you, you plan for service delivery before you plan for therapy or your lessons or whatever it is. I say right. therapy because a lot of the people who I work with are therapists, but it could be, you know, same concept, lesson planning. You know, if you ask the question, I have this student and here are their evaluation results and what should I do in my session? Well, if I don't know what's going on with the whole team, I mean, it's really hard to say what you should be doing because there are so many different people. Like you said, the, the science of reading is pulled from all different fields. 
I mean, yes, um, a speech pathologist, it, it's within their scope to do all of those things. It doesn't mean that they have to be the one delivering right. them. <laughs> they could be training somebody else to do it. Yes. Somebody else could be getting trained to do it. Like the special ed teacher could do it. The general education teacher couldn't do it. Um, typically, like with, with social workers, a lot of times they're working on different things, um, not necessarily literacy, but sometimes I've seen the psychologist do some different things like it. I think that it does kind of depend on your background and training, what it makes sense for you to right. get additional professional development in. Like it would probably make more sense for a speech pathologist to handle the literacy than a social worker or a counselor, even though there's overlap in their scope as well. You know, I've, I've just seen it go yeah. so many different ways. And I, it, you know, it's so context dependent on what the team is doing. I always say like, figure out what needs to be in place. What are the components of effective instruction? And with that in mind, what does the student need? And then what are your resources and how are you going to divide that up among your team? And then you can be like, what do I do in my session when the student is here for 30 minutes? Yeah. And I don't want to leave the parent out of the team either too. I I think that, um, you know, having, especially when it comes to reading, having that reinforcement at home is extremely important. And it goes beyond a lot of times, Parents are just told, oh, you just need to read more to your student at home. But you can read all day and all night. (laughs) If you've got a reading disability, it's not going to do much good. So I think also providing parents with some um, concrete, you know, things that they can do at home, whether it's, you know, a a lot of times I've just shown parents different phonological or phonemic awareness activities that they could do in the car, right? Like just, hey, do some word chaining in the car (laughs) with a student or rhyming in the car with, you know, things that they can do um, so that we're really getting that full day of exposure for the student is important. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I do get that question a lot. And I, it's it's hard because it, again it depends what's going on with the student. Sometimes if I if there's a student who it's like we can't even get out the door in the morning, we can't get to bed on time. I'm probably not going to be like do this phonological awareness activity. I'll probably be more like okay, work on executive functioning or right. uh, just providing structure in your day, and let's get that under control, and then we can start carving out some time to work on reading. And then once once we've got that routine, then we can figure out what do we do within that block of time. Yeah. Decide, you know, to get, because a lot of times parents are so overwhelmed, but there are a lot of parents who do want something really specific to work on with their kids yeah. and they do have the structure in their day. And of course you want to give them specific strategies. So what do you typically, like if you could give, practitioners some recommendations for what they could suggest to parents how do you how do you usually handle that yeah I think that I always like to start with phonemic awareness just because it's something that they could do orally you know parents can do it like I said orally in the car while they're waiting in line at the supermarket just giving them and and my kids loved to when I was really like diving into like research and what all these things were my kids absolutely loved the, the, these games, right? Like I would just say to them like, okay, you know, if I have the word um, big and I change the g to a t, what word does it make? You know, and they would say bit. I mean, that's something you can literally do standing in line at the grocery store, right? It doesn't yeah. take a lot of effort. You don't need materials. Um, it's just something that you can do. So I usually always start with that one. If I have a parent who's looking for, you know, things to do just because it's a really easy, really small snippet of something that they can do. And has a lot of benefit, right? So research has shown us that those phonemic awareness um, skills are really a foundational piece to to having further reading. So that's always where I start. Um, I also do a lot of um, anything oral I find is easy. When you start having, telling them, here's a packet of work, here's, you know, something you have to print, it it gets hard. Um, But language and and, speech language pathologists are experts at this, but language is always something great. Um, So I usually start with things like a kernel sentence, right? Like she ran. And then I would ask my daughter like to add things in like, well, where did she run to? And I'd have her come up with a new sentence, right? Oh, she ran to the store. Okay. How big was the store? She ran to a large store. What color was the store? She ran to a large green store, right? We would just expand these sentences. So anything like that where we're just playing with language, we it, I want it to be fun, obviously, for the yeah. student. For the student I, I don't want it to be something stressful. But I find just little games like that that are oral that parents can do anywhere um, are, are ones that they will follow through on. And um, also, 
if we're in phonics and we're working on targeted uh, graphemes and sounds and phonemes, um, I always like to point that out to parents to look out for that, right? So around Christmas time, um, you know, I was working with a student on that CH can sometimes make a K, it also makes the CH, but it sometimes makes a K. And, you know, the parent would just go around all of the Christmas signs, you know, and, and have the daughter find that CH and repeat the sound and, and things like that. So just really real world things that are going to ma matter to the student and and be fun for them to practice with the parent. Yeah, I like the idea of working it into your day because, you know, there's it's already hard enough to get your child to sit down and do the homework <laughs> that they have to do. And then you're going to give them more homework. And I think that sometimes we feel like, oh, well, we need to we need to do the homework. because That's what we're supposed to do. And it, and really, it it's better if you can find a way to embed it into habits that you already have. Because yeah. if it's too overwhelming, then people don't do it. I mean, it's got to be something that people can stick with. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. Definitely. We're going to take a quick break because we're talking a lot about language and how language skills can support reading and writing. Now, if you are a speech language pathologist and you've wondered, what is my role in this process? How do I actually support kids language skills and really fit into this process. One of the most powerful things you can do is build their vocabulary skills and do it in a way that also pulls print in. So remember, this is something that we want to do on top of a robust reading curriculum. And so if you are wondering how you can create a system for language therapy, really the foundation is around that vocabulary and the elements that fit under it, including syntax, semantics, phonology, morphology, and orthography. So that we're pulling it all together for our students and really filling in those missing gaps that are causing students to struggle with things like comprehension. So if you would like a comprehensive framework for doing that in your language therapy, even if you only have 30 minutes a week with your students, check out my Language Therapy Advanced Foundations program for SLPs. To learn more about what's included, you're going to want to go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language therapy. Again, to learn how to become a member, you're going to want to go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language therapy. Now let's get back to the interview. Do you ever have people say things like, what apps can I use to help my kids learn to read or <laughs> language or yes. language skills? Do you get that question a lot? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. What apps? Is there videos? Is there, you know, programs? And I hate to tell, I'll see a lot of times on social media, like buy this program, buy that program. I hate to tell parents to go buy something else. You know what I mean? We're already doing stuff at school. So I do try and find a lot of, um, you know, free, free things. And I I'll send you a link um, afterwards, but I have a, a, a padlet with just all free materials for all of the different parts of the rope that I usually send people. Um, or if they're looking for a specific, and you know, we want to work on phonics, they can just go to that section and here's all these free resources. There's so much that's free out there. So yeah. I usually try and point people to those free things um, that they can use to reinforce, you know, what's going on at school. Yeah. I mean, I, I get people asking me that. And a lot of times I think, well, like you, you can't just plop your kid down in front of an app and that's not going to build language skills, but I get it where it is nice to have some guidance and structure and it is sometimes nice to have, you know, like if they're going to be on a device some of the time, which most kids right. <laughs> are going to be some of the time, you might as well find something that is there. There are some things out there that are better than others. There there are some sure. videos yeah. out there for kids that are just probably a terrible for them yes. neurologically. Um, I can name a couple. Uh, <laughs> but the other one that people ask about is audiobooks. Do people ask you about how to incorporate audiobooks into their routine for their kids or just in general? Not, not as much. I don't get as much about audiobooks just because most of the people that I talk to are really focused on the actual act of, of reading. Yeah. Um, I do recommend audiobooks, especially, I mean, my own high schooler has ADHD and sitting there reading a book, even though he likes reading, is very difficult for him. So he does really great with an audiobook and he'll follow along. So I do recommend that as a strategy, um, you know, especially as we're older. 
also, I think audiobooks are great for the compre- that language comprehension piece, yeah. right? You know, in, if, especially if you have weaknesses in that language comprehension strand, listening to an audiobook is wonderful. Um, but when we're talking about most of the kids that I'm seeing, we're really talking about their week in that word recognition area, right? They don't have the decoding skills. Yeah. Um, so we're really focused on getting them to be able to read first. And then I think audiobook is a great option, especially as they get older. Yeah. I mean, on one hand, uh, I know that for some kids, they, the reading level is lower. And so the books that they have to read aren't that interesting to them. And then they're not getting a lot of exposure to the language. So an audiobook does give them a chance to listen to something that might be more interesting, or will expose them to language that they're not going to get just via reading. I think where I I, I agree with you. I think they are a good strategy and I think it's great to work them into your routine, especially again, as you get older, if you have someone who is more likely to consume content through an audiobook, well, yeah, like that's a great way for them to incorporate that into their routine if they're not going to be someone who is reading a lot. But I also don't think we should give up on the reading. And no, I know uh, one of the things that I always say to people and and one of the things I think came out of the, the balanced literacy movement is that like we have to instill this like love of reading in children. And in my my view, you don't have to love reading, right? Like <laughs> yeah. some people do, some people don't. I do not want to run. Like I, I am not yeah. a runner. There's people who love running. I don't have to love running, even though it probably would be really good for me. I don't have to do it. You do have to be able to read though, right? So to yeah. function, you really have to be able to read. Do you have to love it? Do you have to sit down every weekend and like, you know, take in a novel? No, but I want you to be able to leave school having the ability to function in your daily life and read an email or read a schedule or read your kids notes that come home from their teacher right those are the things you have to do but you don't have to love reading yeah. <laughs> so I think that um, you know audiobooks are a great you know option as we get older especially if, if and I have a lot of students who really enjoy that process of listening to the book where they wouldn't you know they could read the book and they would struggle through it and they'd read it but they're not going to get as much out of it if they, as you know, they would with the audiobook. So I definitely think it's a good strategy depending on, you know, the student. Yeah. That's, I like that because that is kind of, it is a lot of pressure where it's like, you have to love this. <laughs> a lot of, I know a lot of really successful adults that don't read a lot. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Or they, absolutely. they don't even like to write. They, they dictate it orally. Like I know mm-hmm. people who have, people have written books that way because it's harder for them to just the way that they built up their skills and their habits, it's harder for them. Now, again, yeah. same thing. You don't want to give up on the writing either, but you also don't have to, you know, write a novel. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Or be a, you know, journal every weekend or yeah. <laughs> whatever. And the, the main thing that I always want to clarify for people, because I've, I've had this with teachers where they're like, oh, so I gave the student the test. I, I had them read it. And they failed the comprehension test. And then I get, I, I let them listen to it and then they pass the test. And I'm like, that's great. Um, that's great that they have the language skills to pass that test, but that's not testing reading. It's testing. Yes. Listening. Right. Again, fine. It's, it's great to work on listening, but you have to understand that you're not working on the same skill. Yes. It's, it's different. And that's, that's what I just like to clarify for people. And I think that sometimes it's weird, you know, when you're, even when you're, you're, you know, in online discussion groups, people get so heated about it. And I'm like, no, it's still fine. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just that you're, you got to understand what you're doing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Totally different skill. I mean, it's helpful. And those listening comprehension skills play into reading, Yeah, but that's not what we're, you know, if if we're trying to assess reading comprehension, you actually have to to do the reading. Yes. So like the way that I explain it is, so I, I am a runner. Um, I do like to run. And there's, there's this sort of, um, it's like running and CrossFit are rival cults. And so a lot (laughs) of people are like, you don't really have to run in order to be a good runner. You can just do CrossFit or you can just lift. And I lift because it does make me a better runner. Like it, it, there's transferable skills. It makes me stronger. But if I want to be good at running, I have to run. Like I have to do some (laughs) running. This, this thing supports this thing. But if I have to be good at this over here. I have to do the thing. Yes. And it's kind of the same with 
well, maybe not exactly the same, but similar, similar thing where it's yeah. still can support this other skill over here. But if you want to be good at the skill, you have to do the skill directly, yes. you know? Yeah. So that's how I like to explain it. I've, I've explained it to like, um, with, with some people who, you know, that just go to the comprehension, I'd say, okay, let's say that you're a basketball player and you don't know how to dribble and you're just going to go scrimmage. Well, you're not going to do very well if you don't have those foundational skills. Mm -hmm. Yes, you do. You can't just work on dribbling and then never actually work on playing the game. You do have to do both. But if you don't have the basics down, you're going to just fumble when you actually get into this situation where there's lots of stuff going on, which is what you're asking kids to do when they have to comprehend an entire paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a lot of teachers too that are like, well, it's just so boring, right? To work on that, the phonics or the decoding. And it's boring to you because you've been (laughs) reading for 20, 30 years. But when you've got a kid who's five or six years old and they first put together, you know, CAT and read CAT, they're they're ecstatic, right? Like this is new to them. It's really hard for them. So it might be boring for you as the teacher, but it's really not boring for them. They're they're this is something brand new to them and there's a lot of success for them in putting those, you know, sounds together and blending them together. Um so I think a lot of times we have to just shift our perspective a little bit as to what's yeah. fun for us or what we would like to do as teachers cuz yeah, sure it'd be great to do a craft and read a book and do all those, you know, things that we consider fun, but for the student, a lot of those things that that were just so ingrained because we've been doing them for so long. Those new things to them are fun for them. Yeah. I've heard that argument too. It's like, just because it's not fun for you. Doesn't right. mean it's, well, and maybe it isn't fun for them because it's hard, but eventually it will be. Exactly. Right. You got to get through, yep. get through the, that challenge, but then there's so much growth and so much that comes out of that, right? For your self-esteem, for your, when you work through that challenge and you can read the sent that sentence for the first time, mm-hmm. um, you know, later on in life, those are skills that you're taking with you, right? If I just work through this, if I, you know, focus on it, if I practice, if I put in the time, you know, I can succeed at it. And I think that's an important, important thing for our students to learn. I know it's like, let's not project our boredom onto the students. <laughs> So I have a question about autistic students, because this is kind of a hot topic. There's the whole gestalt language processing and, you know, all of that. And there is a school of thought um, that, so there's, and I see this differently as far as clinical application, because if you have a student who is non-speaking and you're just trying to leverage skills that they have for functional communication, I think it makes sense if they're using, um, you know, if they're they're using a lot of echolalia and things like that to lean into what they're already doing. Um, if they're using just uh, like different um, like phrases and things like that. So that's a totally different topic. But what I have heard in this whole kind of topic is that students with hyperlexia or or autistic students have to learn to read a different way and that the science of reading won't work for them because they're not analytic processors and that, you know, they, they have to learn to read this other way. And so I'm curious what you have found in your research specifically as the science of reading, you know, the science of reading and, and autistic students. Yeah, right. Um, that's not true. <laughs> that's what <laughs> yeah. I've learned. Uh, it's not true. It is harder. It is harder as a teacher to to teach, uh, you know, students who have, you know, certain, I don't want to say more difficult disabilities, but reading wise, you know, it's, it's more difficult to teach them. Absolutely, it can be done. I think one of the first things that I always tell, it, you know, any school that I'm working with is there has to be a shift in mentality, right? We have to come from a place of presuming competence. And that's what a lot of our research tells us is that when we presume competence, when we presume that, yes, these students are going to get it, um, we see a big shift. So we have to come from that place first, understanding that absolutely they can learn to read just like everyone else does. We all learn to read the same way. Our brains all work the same way. (laughs) Um, We all have the same sections of our brain that have to work together, that have to form new pathways in order for reading to happen. Um, so I think that that's the first thing is just, you know, it, it absolutely can happen, but it does take longer and it takes a lot more patience and it takes a lot more creativity. So especially when we're talking about students who are nonverbal, a lot of teachers come to me and say like, well, 
I mean, how can I ever know if they're reading, right? <laughs> they can't yeah. read it out loud to me like you would do with a typical student. Um, but I have been amazed at how many students who I was told could not read or could never read, who when I presented things in a slightly different fashion. So for example, if I put the word, you know, C-A-T cat on a you know piece of paper and ask them, you know, to point to the right picture, right? To point to the picture that they, they were able to read it. Um, and could read whole sentences. And the teachers were like, what? <laughs> I didn't yeah. even know that the student could read, right? Because they were never presented to it in a way that worked with what their cur current communication was. Um, I'm a big proponent of making sure that our students, especially those of our students who are minimally verbal or nonverbal, have some sort of way to communicate. Um, I love the universal core, right? I love it, have, making sure that the entire classroom is on, you know, has the ability to communicate with each other. But it is a big commitment from the teacher, right? Yeah. A big commitment mm -hmm. to ensure that everybody has that communic some sort of communication device to be modeling it to the students, to, you know, have it just constantly all day long. And then to figure out different ways that they can assess and see what learning is actually going on. And that often requires a lot of preparation, which our teachers don't have, unfortunately, right? We have very little time, um, you know, to prepare materials and things that for when we're talking about students who need kind of a different approach. So maybe I have to have a bunch of pictures. For example, if I said, you know, um, the cat is sitting on the mat, I might want to have three different pictures, right? A cat on a mat, a cat on a hat, maybe a cat on a deck. And I want the student to pick the right picture to go with the sentence. That requires a lot of effort on, on the teacher's end to make that happen. It's a lot easier to sit them down with the whole word reading program, right? And just have them, you know, like point to horse, point to horse, point to horse and have them memorize this, this single word. Um, so I, I, it absolutely can be done. It, it's going to probably take you much longer. We have to get really used to wait time. And that's something that's one of the biggest challenges I find is like, you got to give them a lot of wait time right, to work through to work through that. Um, but it definitely everybody learns to read in the exact same way. And it definitely um, can be done no matter matter what the disability is. Um, National Institute of Health has stated that 95% of children are fully capable of reading. Um, and I always like to point out that even that 5%, right, even our students who may have significant um, multiple disabilities have the ability to increase their literacy and language skills, whether yeah. that's, you know, teaching them, you know, working with eye gaze to get them to point to something, whether it's helping them understand that words go from left to right, it's going to look a lot slower. But even that 5% who might not ever be able to pick up a book and read it for cover to cover we can push them in that direction, right? We can do the we can work on those small pre skills. And I think that's where that speech language pathologist really comes into play as well is working on those, you know, how can the teacher reinforce those pre skills, um, you know, to get a little step farther on that, that literacy line, if you will. Yeah. And I think it does go back to, you know, the conversation of some students are not going to follow that neurotypical progression of learning language, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't learn to read using some of the same strategies. Yeah. Because the literacy piece to me is, is different. You know, when you have somebody who had, like, you just need to give them functional communication and they might be, you know, using different phrases, using echolalia, um, using what a lot of people, you know, would refer to as gestalts, then it's, it's, you know, like go with what you have, but at the same time, when you're thinking about the literacy piece, you know, there's not a lot of evidence to show that kids have to be lumped into this category or that category. If you are going to be presuming competence and right. you are going to assume that they're learning how to read. And when, when you have those kids with hyperlexia, it's, it's, yeah, they the comprehension piece isn't there. And so that's why, you know, I like when you're thinking about what impacts comprehension, you've got to go back to the language. Yeah. And I think that's why that having that image of that rope is so important, right? Like it really takes all of those pieces. And I think a big, especially if we're talking about students who, um, you know, have some more significant disabilities, maybe they're not verbal, trying to pinpoint exactly where the problem is can sometimes be really difficult, right? 
Yeah. Um, you know, looking at all these pieces of the rope and trying to figure out well, what exactly, where is the missing link? Where is the missing piece? You know, it really takes some creativity on the part of a school psychologist or a speech language pathologist or the teacher mm -hmm. to figure out how can we assess the student? You know, how can we really figure out and pinpoint where the weaknesses are so that we can determine as a team, what do we want to start with, right? What, what's, where, where should we start? Um, and having that long view picture in mind as, you know, okay, by the time they're, you know, 12 years <laughs> go by, we're going to be there. So right. what can we start with right here? And that small and not, I think a lot of times we get overwhelmed because we think, well, they're in third grade. So by the end of the year, I need them reading at a third grade level, right? And it, that's an overwhelming task to try and take on. So as you are working on your dissertation research, like what things have you found out as you've looked into the research to prepare for your study? Yeah. So what I'm doing with my research is actually taking a look at due process hearings. Oh, um, within the state of Pennsylvania. And what I'm trying to find for our students with autism is what are some of those curriculums, those interventions, those instructional methods that tend to become more of a problem <laughs> than mm -hmm. not. Um, and obviously, uh, applied behavior analysis is a big one that comes up frequently. Um, and the use of ABA in, mm -hmm. within the school day, within instruction um, comes up a lot. Um, because parents want it, school doesn't want to pay for it. So that's one that oftentimes comes up. And then also that whole word reading, it comes up a lot. And what I'm what I have found is that students who were placed in these whole word reading programs, like I said at the beginning, it seems really successful. But what happens is the student gets in the middle school and high school, and the parent realizes my student can't actually read, right? I thought they were reading this whole time. But now I'm realizing they actually don't have those skills to read, right? And so yeah. why didn't the school do something earlier? Why didn't the school, you know, try something else before? The other thing that often comes up is um, that parents wanting some sort of Orton-Gillingham program. So mm -hmm. we talked about Wilson yeah. and Orton-Gillingham. Um, those types of programs, again, very long and very expensive for a school district to provide. Um, but have a lot of success. Parents have, you know, seen other parents have, you know, students who have had success with those. So I'm seeing that we have all these different things that parents oftentimes want and schools don't. And really what I'm looking at is like, why, why are we getting to this point, right? Yeah. This is why I left law in the first place, right? We, by the time they get to me, it's too late. Why are we getting to this point? And what can we do in, you know, that tier one, if we're looking at like a response to intervention or a MTSS type model, what can we do when they're in kindergarten and first grade and second grade to set them up on a trajectory for success so that we're not getting to high school and all of a sudden we realize we're about to enter into the real world and we don't have reading, which to me is the most fundamental skill that you need yeah. in order to, you know, to function. Um, so it's been interesting just to see the types of programs that come up and the types of um, of things that end up leading school districts to get themselves into into due process and to some trouble um, there. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That's, you know, and I think that I always like when people are looking at the programming aspect, because I mean, when I was doing my research, I was I was ready to get in. I wanted to do an intervention study, which is what I did. And but then I have realized as I've been on the teaching side and the professional development side that the interventions are really important. But if you don't have the programming and the support, it's really hard to get anything done. And that's why I'm kind of doing some of the work that I'm doing now, just thinking about the leadership angle, because you can have the best program in the world. But if you, you don't have the logistics and the funding and the people and the all that other stuff, then it's never going to happen. <laughs> Yeah. And I think the leadership piece is, is super important, especially, I feel like special education in general, um, it's better as a special education teacher, school psychologist, counselor, yeah. uh, speech language psychologist. A lot of times we get left out of the discussion, I know, number one, yeah. um, and left out of the training, left out of the curriculum decisions, right? Everything's just kind of decided. Um, and what I find a lot of times is that our students all of a sudden go through, you know, all these interventions and then the team decides, oh, 
they're not working for the student, we're going to put them in special education. And then the special education teacher is like, I guess, supposed to be some sort of magic worker. It's probably the same <laughs> with SLPs, right? We're That's just supposed so to have familiar. some magic thing. <laughs> Nothing worked for them in tier one, tier two, or tier three, all these interventive, in, interven- intensive interventions. But now you're supposed to magically just like fix them, like, right? Teach them, just magically teach them how to read. But you're not really given any training. You're not really doing any curriculum. You just have this IEP that says you have to teach this kid to read. Um, So I feel like leadership is, it's really important that leadership from the beginning includes not only a special education teachers, but that SLP, that counselor, that, that school psychologist in the conversation and in the training and in the decision making. Yeah. I mean, because if you think about it, special ed, all of these other people are supposed to be in addition to, like they're supposed to be on top of an already robust curriculum. I mean, because that's their foundation. And that's, you know, like if you don't have that in place, then it's going to be really hard to do your job. That was key when I was, so when I was in my district, the, the psychologist was kind of more involved in those team meetings. And she was the one that was like, hey, we need to get the SLP in here. And so that was, that was nice to get the foot in the door that way. But it, I've talked to other people who are related service providers who are like, I can't get on that team. And they're making all of these decisions and expecting it to work a magic, you know, my magic that I can't do because I wasn't involved early on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I find, I mean, and to no fault of administrators, but a lot yeah. of times administrators have no background knowledge in special education, let alone in speech and language pathology. Right, yeah. right? They don't have any background. Um, so I think it's really important for uh, for them to understand fully each of the roles of all of those different people that are involved in special education, what they're expected to do. I was always surprised that my administrator had no idea the amount of paperwork, the amount of meetings, the amount of like little yeah. things that like you had to do to make it all happen. <laughs> they didn't know. Um, so I think it's important for them to understand that so that they can really facilitate leading that team, you know, to help the student. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. They need to know. We need to uh, we need to be leaders in our current position so that the people who are in the, uh, you know, making those decisions are supported and have the right information to make those good decisions. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is a good place to wrap up. I feel like we could keep going on this topic for a long time, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. So where can people go to learn more about you and what you do and um, your podcast and all of the things? Yeah. So I have a podcast. It's called the special, uh, the science of special education. I also have a YouTube channel by the same name. So you can search either of those. Um, we have a Facebook group, uh, that's called the science of reading special education. So if you're interested in, um, reading for anything, it would be great for SLPs or, um, special education teachers or anyone working with that population of students to join where we talk about a lot of, um, you know, programs, a lot of methods, things like that in that group. And then you can also go to my website, which is www.brettestevens with a V.com. Those would probably be the best places to get a hold of me. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Before I sign off, I wanted to remind you to check the show notes for all of the links that were mentioned in this episode, including all the places that you can go to connect with Brett and learn more about what she does and listen to her amazing podcast. And also to learn more about some of the programs that I mentioned that relate to the content in this episode, including Language Therapy Advanced Foundations. Again, check the show notes. And also, if you want to learn more about the executive functioning guide that I mentioned that can really get your team working together to provide support for behavior, social skills, and overall academic performance, then definitely check out that guide. Again, the page where you can go sign up for the executive functioning guide is drkarendudekbrandon.com backslash EF schools. So... Remember, it always helps me out if you rate and review and follow my show wherever you listen to your podcast, whatever directory you're using, whether it's Apple, Spotify, or something else. 
And finally, if you have a suggestion for a guest for the show, or if you would like to be a guest on the show, please email me at talktome at drkarenspeech.com. I'm always looking for amazing guests who are showing some type of leadership when it comes to supporting K-12 kids. So thank you again for listening, and I will see you next time. 